Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today we are going to continue on with our introduction slash tutorial for John Tiller software games. As I mentioned at the top of every one of these, if you learn this basic system, you can play any one of his myriad of games over different time periods and different wars. It's a really nice system, I think, and it allows you to leverage out into all those different eras that you might be interested in. Uh, the, the system itself is simple, yet complex, <laughs> right? You say, oh, okay, so you just basically said nothing. No, I mean, the game can look somewhat simplistic. You have quality, you have some leadership values, and that's it. But you have modifiers that go into these things. Everything is based on dice rolls of one to six, okay? So anyway, this is episode number nine. In this episode, we're gonna talk about routing and leadership. Now, last time we talked about disruption and command. You see command here, this is in yellow. We'll talk about this for Longstreet. And then you see leadership. So this leader has two different ratings, a command C, which is equal to a four, a leadership B, which is equal to a five when compared to a six-sided dice roll. Um, now, last time we had some units here that were disrupted, okay? They were disrupted uh, because they had taken some fire and some casualties. And as I mentioned last time, the tiller system is kind of built around what happens once your troops start taking casualties. Well, in this case, our troops got some defensive fire. And what is defensive fire? Well, we were moving. We don't have to be moving towards the enemy. We could be moving right or left. We could even be moving backwards. But we were moving or we were firing or attacking the enemy. When that happens, there is something called defensive fire where the defender gets the first shot if the computer thinks that is warranted. So it doesn't have to do it. It runs some algorithm that you or I would never understand, I'm sure, uh, but it runs an algorithm and it says, oh, well, this is a high value unit or this is a unit that we could maybe get into disruption, you know, whatever the case may be. It can fire first. Well, we had charged a Union Cavalry detachment here and destroyed them, right? But when that happened, they shot some defensive fire at us. And this works both ways. If the Union moves or comes towards us or attacks us or fires at us, we may very well fire a defensive fire. We have no control over that. It's completely a computer controlled thing. OK, now when you play another human, you could choose to do that yourself. I would recommend strongly against it. The computer and defensive fire works very well, I think, in this game. It's a very well thought out, fleshed out component of the game. You can play this game in phases. I will tell you, if you would only do that against a human op opponent and that would take way too long by email essentially every turn becomes like six turns right so this is a turn-based game that's how i look at it it's the only way i've ever played it so um when we took that defensive fire and we suffered casualties we had to take a morale check and we talked about that the base for your morale check is always your quality. Now, it may be called morale in other games. In the World War II games, it's definitely called morale, which I guess, you know, you should be reminded, well, it's a morale check. We should probably look at the morale, right? Quality is kind of the same thing. You know, the Civil War games came out at a different time than the World War II games. I think they changed the name at some point thinking, well, it's confusing. We should just call this morale. Uh, but they're the exact same thing for our purposes here. When a unit takes any casualties, they have to take a morale check. If they take those casualties from defensive fire and they fail their morale check, they become disrupted.
and disrupted means they're operating at 50% for movement purposes and firing effective purposes. So they're doing everything at 50%. It's kind of an in-between stage of a unit where it starts to get a little disintegrated. It starts to, you know, it's taking losses. Maybe the lead, they can't see the leader. Things are getting, you know, going, starting to go crazy a little bit. They start to mor lose morale. They lose it first to disrupted if it's defensive fire. If it's any other kind of fire, okay, so offensive fire or they get attacked by a melee, um, if it's anything other than defensive fire and they fail their morale check, they become routed. And you can just think of routed, if you want to think of a simple way of thinking about it, is they run away. They take off. Routed means there's no organization anymore. You're going to see this unit, I call it routing out, because it's kind of funny how fast it happens. Not so funny when it's one of your units, but it goes and ends up like back here. Take it, They just get the heck out of there. You know, they're out of dodge. So that happens if they're getting attacked, they're getting fired at offensively from the enemy, and they fail their morale check. Now, if they pass their morale check, nothing happens. They're fine. They may gain some fatigue. They may gain some casualties. I say gain. They may lose some men, um, but gain fatigue. But, you know, nothing negative per se happens other than those counters start to, you know, add up. Those losses start to add up a little bit. Or the fatigue, This see, this is up to 88 already. The fatigue starts to build up. Uh, which can have negative effects that we've talked about. Um, but if they, so if they fail their morale check uh, for all of the different modifiers we talked about last time, there are like eight different modifiers. If they fail that, defensive fire, they disrupt 50%. If they fail from offensive fire, they route out. Okay. So once that happens, then what does the game do? And again, I said this before in a previous episode, I always think of this game as it's like it moves in twos. You're either in movement or combat mode. When you attack, you can either melee or fire. You know, it moves in twos. So now we're either disrupted or we're routed. And I say we, I mean an individual unit. Every unit is, is treated individually, even if they're part of the same brigade. Um, so every unit, is going to be in one of those two states if they failed their morale check. For disruption, we went through that last time and how that's resolved. A big part of that is based on the command rating of its leader, the unit's leader, and the command rating of his leader all the way up the chain, the entire chain of command here. So as I said last time, we would start with Beauregard, he does a command check, right? He's a C. He has to four, roll a four or less, and he passes his command check. He did that this time. Longstreet then gets a plus one from his superior commander. In this case, that is the Army of the Potomac. That is Beauregard. He gets a plus one from him. He's already a C, which is four, so he bumps up to a five. Now you can see here, he failed his command check this time, meaning he rolled a six, or the game rolled a six, and he failed his command check. Well, that's unfortunate. But fortunately, our units actually, they two of them had disrupted last time when he passed his command check, uh, and this one also passed this time. It must have rolled a one. OK, so they are out of disrupted status, and that's how you get units out of disruption. They have to be within the command radius of their commander, and you test it against their commander's command. OK, so what happens with routing? Well, routing goes into this leadership score. So disruption is command, routing is leadership. All right. When these things route out of here like this, if they end up in the same hex as their leader, which is very unlikely. Well, let me back up for a second. 
let's talk about the base case. Okay, I like to talk about the base case and build from there. When these guys route out, before the next turn, they are going to do a rally check to see if they come out of routed status. So routed to me is 0%. They can't really move, they can't really fire. Now, if they get attacked, they may you know, throw some defensive fire, but they can't essentially do anything. You can't get them to do anything if they've routed. They're at 0%. Um, if that happens before the next turn, they will do a rally check. And that rally check, the base case is, it's based on their quality, quality or morale. Okay, so in this case, they're a quality C. If they roll a four or less, they will become unrouted and become disrupted. Okay, so that's that intermediate phase, right? We have normal, disrupted, routed. If they do their rally check, which is based on their quality, and they pass it, they then become disrupted. And then before the next turn, they will do another you know, they'll do a disruption test or, a, you know, they'll do another check with their leader. And then they can become undisrupted and back up to their normal effectiveness. Okay, so it's just, you know, routed, disruption, normal. To get out of routed, they have to pass a quality, you know, a morale check against their morale or quality score, which is a C or a 4. So they've got a 66% chance to do that. How could that uh, be increased? You know, we're always looking and I'm always talking about how can we up our odds? How can we use the modifiers to our advantage? Well, if they are stacked with a leader, their leader or another leader, they can take all, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I hate that sound so much. Uh, here's Beauregard. Okay, so this goes for all leaders on the map. Anyone that's in their chain of command, let's put it that way. It's not all leaders on the map, uh, but anyone that's in their chain of command, if they are in a hex with them, they can take their leader's leadership score. Now, in this case, his leadership is a C. So let's say one of these units routes and they end up right here in Beauregard's hex. Okay, they can take his leadership score if it is better than their, gosh darn it, if it's better than their quality. Now in this case, it's exactly the same. It's C and C, but there's one more, I just wanna do one more twist, stick with me here. If they do, if it's the same, you actually get a plus one here. So they'll get the higher leadership if the leadership is higher. So let's just say these troops are a D. Don't we have the, yeah, okay, okay, this is the perfect example. Let's say these guys route out of here and end up in Beauregard's hex, okay? They're routed. So the next turn comes and before that turn there's a rally check. Normally, the game would say, okay, they have to roll a three or lower, a three, two, or a one, and they pass their rally check because this is a quality D. But if they're in the hex with Beauregard, Beauregard is a C for leadership. They can take that leadership score. So now all of a sudden, it's a four. They get a four. They get you know, a little bit of a bump because he's a good leader, they can take on his leadership score. But there's one little slight, slight twist to that. And that is if it's the same, so in this case, it's quality C, they end up in this hex routed. When they do their rally check, they will get a, since they're exactly the same, they actually get a plus one so that it becomes five. And think about why that might be. Well, it doesn't seem fair. These are lower quality troops. They get to take his score, which is a C, okay? Um, you know, so these D troops get to be a C. When these C troops come back, if it was just they get to take the same, they would be the same as these D troops and the quality wouldn't mat matter as much. But by them, if it's the same by them coming back here, they get a plus one for their check 
because it's C and C. Okay? Now you may say, well, that didn't seem very likely that they're just going to go and end up right back here. And you are correct. As you play the game more, you'll start to understand where things may route to. They route to safety. Um, I know that if these units route, I've played the game enough, they will end up either like right back here or right back here. In addition, when it's someone of the that's at a higher rank than their direct leader. So, you know, let's just say we would have kept Longstreet back here. If they end up in Longstreet's hex, it works exactly the same. And he actually is a leader B, which is even better, right? But you probably want him up here in the front lines giving bonuses to your fighting troops, right? They get bonuses for being stacked with him. You don't want him all the way back here. You're kind of, you know, you're defeating the purpose of him being a, a good leader and stacking with him. So you're probably going to use your your leaders that are of, a, are of a higher command to do these rally checks or to try to get bonuses for these rally checks. And there's a little twist to that too. When it is leaders of a higher degree, so higher than Longstreet, who is their direct leader, if this was a divisional commander, or in this case, it's an army commander, they can be within one hex of him. So they don't have to be directly in the same hex. They can be within one hex of him. And because of that, I wanted to keep him over here at first to kind of show you this concept. But because of that, and I think these guys, if they route, maybe would go here. They may go here. We'll talk a little more about routing and where they may go in the future. I'm going to put him right here. And why is that? Because if any of those guys route and they end up in this area, he can help them with their rally check. And back here, he's not in the line of fire. He's behind this ridge. He's not going to get fired at back here unless the, you know, they just break through, in which case he's mount, you know, he's mounted. He can take off out of here. Um, but that's how routing and rally checks work. So with that said, it's our turn. It's turn five of 21, Confederate turn here. We're at 1020 in the AM now. Let's see if we had any troops arrive. Okay, we had a supply train that arrived down here. Now let's not forget, we've got all of these guys to move forward. They've got all their movement points. Um, we have this bottom group here. Let's move them up here as far as we can. Okay, they still have three movement points left. For this, I actually kind of like to move back. See, it's only taking one movement point to move them up this road because they're in a column, they're in a movement formation. It's only taking one on this major road. So, you know, in 20 minutes, they got to move quite a ways. If uh, every one of these is a football field, you know, that's quite a ways, right? Uh, let's take early here and get him moving out here as far as we can. So we just, oh, I'm going to turn that volume off so sorry guys i hate that sound so much i'd say that every episode um let's drag his next okay i just want to check over here and make sure it's movement zero they're reinforcements we want to get them there as fast as we can as you can see you know long street is coming under some pressure he has already had some units disrupt so we want to get these forces up here as fast as we can. Now this wagon train we will probably keep with early. You generally want a wagon train with each brigade. Um, now these guns are sort of unattached, right? They're Army of, of the Potomac, so they can kind of be anywhere, really. Uh, these guys are blue. They're part of Bonham's Brigade. They'll come up here. Now, before we do anything else, remember these guys are locked. Uh, I did want to go look at the um, info, victory. How are we doing? Now, the Union has 25 objective points. Okay. Um, they have taken six infantry losses. So we've gotten two points for that. It's 0.33 points, evidently, per infantry loss. But look at this. We've given them 192 cavalry losses, which has given us 153 points. We have lost 44 men, infantry, uh, but again, it's kind of looks like ours is even less than 0 0.3. No, it's a little bit more than 0 0.33. I guess it's like 0 0.4, maybe 0 0.36, something like that. We could get out the calculator and figure it, but it seems to be just slightly higher than uh, Union infantry. 
point losses. Um, and so these points are based on, on the union, since they're the first side. The union is now at negative 113. If you want to flip that on its head, we're, we're at positive 113 for points. Uh, but these victory values are based on what the union score is. You'll see to defeat them in a minor way, we need them to get to negative 300. Ultimately, we'd like to take them to a negative 600. So when I do these turns, I like to do reinforcements first, at least reinforcements that are way behind the lines. Now, these guys are reinforcements, but you know, we get them up in here, they might get fired at by defensive fire, because that can even come from guns. Now, I can tell you it's not going to come from this gun, because it is limbered, so it cannot fire at us yet, but, uh, you know, it's always something to keep in mind. Guns can only fire when they're unlimbered. Now, what are we going to do here? We still have, we have our guns. Um, I don't believe, yeah, we have not gone through our artillery dialogue, so these are grayed out. We can't use those. Let's go look at our guns and see what we can fire. Okay, so we're on these guys. This will light up yellow, the units we can fire at. Now, generally, I like to fire at things on the move, and many times you want to go gun to gun. Now, last time I shot our cannon at their cannon over here because it was on the move. Generally, when something is in move mode, it will take more casualties, but when you fire gun to gun, you're generally not going to cause gun losses, what you're going to cause is fatigue, okay? Because our artillery, this is something I haven't mentioned before, artillery takes double fatigue. So a lot of times you want your guns firing at their guns because you fatigue them and you, uh, you take their effectiveness way down because their fatigue is doubled artillery fatigue is doubled compared to infantry units okay i guess that's because these guys to move the cannons around you know they're dodging uh shrapnel flying around you know that could be very exhausting i i just made that up in my mind uh i'm sure they have an incredibly good reason why that is true so last time though i fired at them they're also a little closer so we would do more quote unquote damage whether that be casualties or fatigue uh, these guys a little further away. Let's go ahead and hit their guns again. So all I did was right click because I've got the artillery dialogue up. Click off this. Okay, we have another gun there that can fire. So you'll see over here, these are stacked. They will be listed as two separate ones down here, right? So the first one has fired. That was just one gun. Now we have another unit, another card here, two guns that can fire. Let's hit them again. We'll just right click, hit them with more. Now we don't know how much that fatigue is, but we really hope that we're lowering their effectiveness. So both of these guys have fired. They're all done. That's it. You can't do anything else with them. Uh, that's that. So then we'll go on to the next one. Okay. And which gun? It's these guns right here. Now we could click off and do this manually if we wanted, but you can't, you know. You don't see this. I like to do it through the artillery dialogue. So let's double click on them again and you'll see the three units we can hit. This is great, okay? They're in our field of vision, right? We remember when that unit was down here, these guns could not see it. So they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get it in range. Now these are, you know, we've got a range 18. So it gets all the way, we can't see this gun, right? It's behind this forest, even though it is on an elevation. That's actually a good question. We've got this lit up. Let's see what we can see. It's selected. Nope, we can't see these guys. We can't see these guys either. They're behind a forest. We can see these guys though. And we can either do this manually or through the artillery dialogue. Like I said, I always like to do it here. Now, what do we want to hit here? Well, it's a good question. You know, you can kind of decide what you want to. For illustri illustrative purposes, I'm going to hit the unit with a leader. Now, in game terms, remember when they would do a disruption check, they're going to get a bonus for being with the leader. I would maybe hit one of these units instead, but I want to do this for a purpose. So let's right click on this and we hit two men. Oh, I said I wanted to do it for a purpose and that purpose didn't exist. Uh, shoot. Well, what I was talking about, I, I forgot. There were two units here. What I was talking about is if you right click, 
let's say these two units were stacked together. If you, when you right click, you'll get another dialogue asking you which one of these two you want to fire at. Okay. I was thinking it would be the same here, but it's not right because a leader does not count as a separate unit for those purposes. You can't just fire at a leader. You have to fire at a unit. Um, and so it didn't give us the choice. Instead, it just fired at this whole hex. Two men were disabled. Um, so shoot, uh, later on we'll see that when things are multiple units are stacked, we will hit right click and a dialog box will come up. It'll say, let's say the first Indiana or the second Indiana, and we'll pick which one we're firing at, okay? Okay, let's click on this next one. It's these guns over here. They have the same groupings, uh, you know, or the same guys that they can fire at, same units. Let's fire at this one this time. They lost one man. Okay, cool. Now, so we fired our guns. We've gone through all of our artillery. We've got Beauregard over here, our supply. I, I like them being here. We could maybe put one here, but I'm afraid if the Union moves here, they would attack, uh, you know, they would attack us right here, I think, eventually. Um, we've got our reinforcements on the way. Now, I will warn you, cavalry counts a lot more. We saw that with that victory score. When you lose cavalry, it hurts a lot more. Do not use them like infantry. You want to use them to wait until you've maybe routed units, you see a supply wagon, you see guns undefended, then you bring your cavalry around and attack. Now in this case, we're a little outmanned or we might be. So I brought them up here to kind of wait and see what happens. I may even move them to dismounted, but I'm not gonna do that this time. Okay, so we'll come back to these guys and what we're gonna do with them, but let's move over here. We have a decision to make. Now, is it possible that some Union troops are moving here? Yes. Is it possible some Union troops are gonna move down this branch? Yes. Do we have an opportunity to maybe enfilade these troops, meaning we can come down this, you know, little canyon valley. It wouldn't be a canyon. It's only 30 feet, right? But you can get behind this ridge. They can't see you. It's possible that we could get around these guys. So it's a, it's a thought that maybe we might do that. I am going to take these higher quality troops. Now, these are quality D, but they have a range of four, right? They could pop up right here and fire at these guys. These guys could not. They have a range of two, but they are higher quality. So I'm actually going to start moving them this way a little bit and get them down here in this ridge. I'm going to do the same with this group. Whoops. And I wasted a dang turn. I wasted a movement point. I should have gone back and un... I don't think you can undo the last... No, you can't when you're out of movement points. Well, that's okay. I wanted to get them right here and probably could have. Uh, I'm going to leave these guys back here because they do have a range of four. Um, I'm just going to leave them back here, but I'm going to keep moving Bonham's guys up here because I think that maybe we can get a little bit of an advantage and get them from the side. Now, you know, we got to be careful here. We don't want to get in a situation where we get our butts kicked here and we're in full retreat. But I also know I've got reinforcements coming and I've got early early's brigade coming. Now, traditionally, you would bring early's brigade here because this is where the main prong of this attack is is going to come historically. Now, we're not playing the historical scenario, so the AI can kind of do what it wants. But I think if we sneak around here we may be able to take them by surprise. They shouldn't really know where we are here. Let's look. They can't see us there. They can't see us there. Not there. Now, it's possible these guns from up here could possibly spot us, or even the one back here, but I don't think so. And I think we can sneak right around them here. So let's see if that's gonna work. But uh, before we do that, I am going to do something you may say, huh, what are you doing? We are playing defense here, right? We're starting to get a little outnumbered. 
They're bringing up troops. We're in a good defensive position. We're right on the pathway here. We're right above the Ford. If anybody comes across the Ford here, uh, we've got them in our firing range. I know that Longstreet has failed his command test this time. Okay, so I don't want to draw any fire. So I don't really want to move and I really don't want to fire. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to let our fatigue maybe run off a little bit. I'm going to make sure or at least try to not get uh, disrupted or routed for as long as I can until early can get here or until bottom can get around the edges here. So I'm just going to sit here. And I know that you don't often do that in war games or, you know, when you're playing against the AI, generally you're really on the offense, you know, that's just kind of how you, the AI always plays better on the defense in any war game I've ever played. Um, maybe with a couple of exceptions. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but generally they play better on the defense. Uh, and so many times you're not used to being patient and playing defensively. I can tell you against a human, you better get used to that because you need, if you have the advantage of the high ground here and you have a guy that you know has failed a command test, if you don't want to take a morale check right now, um, Sometimes it's okay just to sit still, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to go through the rest. Now, these guys did not have anyone they could fire at. We can see here, we can try to fire, and it'll say line of sight is blocked by terrain, and it'll show us where. It's this forest. Okay, so all I did was hit control and went up here and tried to fire at it. It shows us the terrain that blocked that. Um, this guy, we're, we are going to just sit him here. We're going to bring all the bottom up here. Now, I let this guy, I think, get out of our command radius. I did. It's actually beneficial this is back here. But I don't think we're going to get fired at next turn. So we'll get them caught up. We're not going to get him, let him pop up out of this rabbit hole here before he's got command with him. Um, all right. Let's keep going here. We've got the wagon train. The wagon train we want to might want to move up. Uh, you cannot put wagon trains in forests. Just keep that in mind. Uh, also, cavalry will get disrupted it mo if it moves into a forest. That's something else to keep in mind. Uh, now, so these guys, we're just gonna we're gonna let them sit. Uh, this wagon train, that's fine. That's fine. All units have been considered. Okay, let's uh, run this turn and see what happens. So it's the Union turn number six. Okay, they're coming across the Ford. They are continuing their attack. They're getting more guns. And you see they are coming down. You know, they're coming in numbers, right? So we're, we're playing a little fast and loose with Bonham down here. I'm mainly doing that because we have those reinforcements coming. So I feel like we can be a little more aggressive. Okay, they've, they've shot at us. We defensive fired them. Ooh. We took, oh, we, they really took some losses there. Um, okay, and they checked for one unit to reduce fatigue. The reason it says it only checked one unit is since these guys did defensive fire, they could not uh, lose any fatigue. They maybe didn't gain any either, but one unit in here did not fire, so they checked to see if it, it regained, you know, or lost any fatigue since that counts up. Uh, and it did not, and it's just telling you that. We got no reinforcements this time, <clears throat> but we also did not disrupt. Uh, nothing bad happened. We didn't disrupt our route. Now, why is that partially, okay? And why did I not move last time? Is because if I would have moved or fired, they would have defensive fired, and they would have done a morale check. The computer would have done a morale check on any of these units that took casualties. Longstreet had already failed his command test for that turn. That was turn five. Remember, we go second, right? And so I knew by not moving or firing, we did not run the risk of having any morale checks in turn five, which is the turn where he failed. The Union goes first in turn six, and we look at turn six, and now he has passed his command check. 
and I'm a little less worried about a morale check for our units. Because remember, if he fails, or if these guys are detached from him, they're automatically a one for morale check. So they've only got a 16% chance of passing it, uh, which is not very good. I don't need to tell you that. You don't need to be a mathematician um, to figure out that if he's got to do a one or less, that's only a one. <laughs> so that's not good. That's why I did not move last time. Now he's passed. We've got these guys down here. This is the things are heating up, but I think I've maybe got them surprised here. Now we have another leader, so we've got a whole nother brigade coming down here. Looks like they've got one brigade. Uh, they've got cavalry here that may be independent or maybe its own brigade. Uh, we have Beauregard stationed back here because we are going to have someone route sooner rather than later, unfortunately. Again, we have more reinforcements on the way, leading me to send Bonham's troops forward. Um, we have early on the way. You know, when we get up here, we'll see how things are going. But we may need early to hold on to this ridge because we may start getting pushed back. As you can see, they're trying to get across this ford and this ford. The AI in this game is actually pretty decent. Even if you've heard uh, that's not true, I, I don't agree with that at all. For these stock scenarios, they, have they know what they're going for. So anyway, I think that brings this episode to a close. When we come back next time, so I'm going to save this sucker. Uh, I'm pretty excited to play this out. Things, things are heating up. Uh, when we come back next time, we're going to, you know, kind of recap what happened uh, in the first part of turn six and then start the second part of turn six, which, of course, is our move. So for Strategy Gaming Dojo, thank you so much for joining me. This is a blast for me. You know, I get to play the game and just talk about it. Uh, so I, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. I hope you are, too. If you are... Uh, please give me a subscribe down below. Maybe hit the little like button or hit the bell to be notified when these videos come up. Uh, but, you know, I would appreciate it. So until next time, Strategy Gaming Dojo, I'll talk to you.